Our scripture reading this morning is Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs is a very valuable book in every way, but it's particularly the last half of the chapter that deals with the sins of the tongue. Proverbs 26, as snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool, cutteth off the feet, and drinketh damage. The legs of the lame are not equal, so was a parable in the mouth of fools. As he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. The slothful man saith, There is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful man upon his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am I not in sport? Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail-bearer, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone it shall return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So far we read God's holy word. 
The basis of this and many other passages of God's Word is the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 43. Lord's Day 43. Commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The ninth commandment, the catechism asks, what is required in the ninth commandment? And the answer, that I bear false witness against no man, nor falsify any man's words. That I be no backbiter, nor slanderer. That I do not judge, nor join in condemning any man rashly or unheard. But that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit as the proper works of the devil, unless I would bring down upon me the heavy wrath of God. Likewise, that in judgment and in all other dealings I love the truth, speak it uprightly, and confess it, also that I defend and promote as much as I am able the honor and good character of my neighbor. Beloved in the Lord, the ninth commandment obviously addresses the sin of lying. Lying has become so common in our society that in many circumstances we assume that someone is covering up the truth, is lying to us. You go to buy a car, you assume that the person selling that car is covering something up. There's There has to be something wrong with this car that he's not telling you. There must be some deceit here in what he's saying. An ad for a product that is presenting how great this product is, you're wondering, okay, what's really the catch here? It can't surely do all the things that they're saying it does. What's the deceit? In business, very often, lying is a way of life. Workers lie to cover up what they didn't do quite right. Factories send products off that are defective and lie about it. Businessmen lie to get the bid. In the education world, especially when you get up, well, in the lower grades, there's cheating on tests. In the upper grades, there's men who produce papers that they really haven't produced. They're plagiarizing. Or they produce papers that supposedly come to a glorious conclusion and in fact it doesn't prove that at all in the scientific realm. Lying seems to become, have become a commonplace thing. In the political races it's abominable. They are continually lying about their, the opponent's record or their own record. Whether it's an outright lie or it's a uh, exaggeration of what's really true, taking words out of context and putting them in another. Every time an event happens, political parties all over are trying to come up with a way to put a spin on it, as they say. What is that? It's nothing more than lies that they want people to believe this is really why this happened or what really happened. And the news media adds their own kind of lies telling us the important things of the world, but they're only telling us the things that they want us to hear, and they're giving us the viewpoint they want us to have, and to be able to react the way they want us to react and think as they want it. Statistics are rolled out, and things are measured and evaluated, and in the end, the statistics lie. They are not not telling us the whole truth, but only a part of it. Even in the religious world, churches lie. They have confessions. They claim that they hold to these confessions, but they do not. They may take a bold stand for the truth and say, oh yes, 
We believe in justification by faith alone. No works. And then they have a minister who preaches justification by faith and works, and they do not discipline him. They've lied with a bold stand against the lie and saying, we stand for the truth, and yet they allow ministers to preach something that is the opposite. Ministers claim that they are preaching Christ, preaching the Scriptures, only the Reformed faith, when in reality they are not. In the face of such a barrage of lies and deceit, there is a grave danger that it becomes something acceptable. That in our own minds, when we lie just a little bit, and we say, but it's not like all those big lies out there, that we can justify our lies. Lying, deceit, hypocrisy, backbiting, slander is so common that it can become a way of life for us practiced by believers in their homes, in the schools, and even in the church. So God comes to us this morning with a reminder of how dreadfully wicked that is. He tells us, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. God's word to us this morning is, I speak the truth. I am the truth. I never lie. You too must always speak the truth at every moment, under every circumstance, speak only the truth. So let's consider this morning, this Lord's Day, under the theme, the use of the tongue, and our emphasis will be on the, in the covenant, the use of the tongue in the covenant. And first of all, our calling there is to speak the truth. And secondly, it is to resist all deception, all evil, which is deception. And thirdly, enjoying blessed fellowship. The tongue in the covenant is a vitally important part of the covenant. Speaking the truth, resisting all deception, there, through the use of the tongue, enjoying blessed fellowship. The importance of the truth is that all truth leads back to God. It all does. Because God is truth. He is truth. And He is truth because He is unchanging. Jehovah, the I am, that I am, always the same. Therefore, He is the standard of truth, that unchanging standard. Man pretends to be searching for truth. And I say pretends because Romans chapter 1 says that man actually holds the truth down. He suppresses the truth. In his unrighteousness. He really does not want to know the truth. And that's because the truth is God. He doesn't want to know the truth about God, about himself, or about life. Philosophers discuss and argue and they develop their theories and says, this is truth. And another philosopher comes along and shows that it can't work, it's illogical, it fails in this point or in that point and says, no, I have found truth. When Jesus said to Pilate that he had come into the world to bear witness to the truth, which he did, of course, he came to bear witness of God, Pilate mocked him and said, What is truth? What is truth? Everybody talks about truth. Nobody knows what it is. And today most have concluded with Pilate, you can't find truth. No one can be certain of truth. Truth is relative. 
There are no absolutes in truth. You can't possibly say to someone, this is true, you know, this is truth. Today it's true last year, it's true a hundred years ago, it'll be true in a hundred years. It's true. They say, no, that's impossible. Truth is relative. It depends on the circumstances, whether or not you say something is true or not. No man has a corner on the truth, they will say. Truth is subjective. It's, it has to do with your viewpoint in life. Even within the church, this becomes a reality when you say to somebody, okay, look, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what God is and what He does. And they'll say, oh, well, that's your interpretation. Your interpretation of this. So even within the church, this becomes a problem. The people do not have an unchanging standard. It's relative. Truth changes. The Bible says, no, that's not so. God is truth. He is the unchanging reality. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says that. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. That is, having to do with righteousness. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. He's a rock. And you think of a rock, children, that huge rock, not a little pebble now, but a huge rock that stands there. Year after year, the sun shines on it, the snows go on it, the winds blow on it, but it stays there, unchanging rock. That's what God is. That's a picture of what God is. He is unchanging and he said that explicitly in Malachi 3.6. I am Jehovah, he said. I am Jehovah. I change not. I change not. He is truth. He is truth. So much is God truth that he said, I cannot lie. I cannot lie. Numbers 13, 19. Numbers 23, rather. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And the answer is obviously, yes, he will. Because he cannot lie. Scripture says, in order to emphasize that God is truth, all His works are done in truth. His Son is called the Word, and the Word is truth, according to John 17. He sent His Son to reveal Himself. No one else could do it properly. Only the Son who knows Him perfectly is able to show to us perfectly, truly, who God is. Thy Word is truth. That's Jesus. Jesus sent His Spirit. What is the Spirit called? The Spirit of truth. The truth is eternal, we sing in the Psalms. It's above the heavens. All of that because God is that unchanging rock. The truth about God is vitally important. Your salvation depends on it totally. Salvation is in the way of Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth. He is that. The truth, said Jesus in John 8, shall set you free. You're in bondage to sin. What sets you free? The truth does. Not the lie. The truth. Knowing God, who is truth, that's eternal life. Knowing Him is eternal life. Well, you have to know the truth then about Him, and then you have eternal life. We are begotten by the word of truth, said James. We are sanctified by the truth, said Jesus. The truth. All those who perish have not received the love of the truth. They don't love it. The truth is important for all of our life. It's important for worship. You must worship God in spirit and in truth. When you come to worship, we must worship Him as He truly is, the God of truth. 
And you must know exactly then what has God performed it for us in order that we may worship Him, the God who is truth. The preacher is rightly commanded to divide the word of truth properly. The word of truth. And the scripture commands us, buy the truth and sell it not. You see how important truth is? But that isn't true merely of the Bible. And when we're talking theology. But you see, that extends into our daily life. The things that we say are true in this life or things that we describe and we say this is what truly happened, they are that because God is behind them controlling and determining all these things. And I mean that literally everything. The carpet on the floor is green. It's been green since they laid it here. It'll be green next week. Why is that? Because God preserves this creation. He preserves it. And the colors stay the same. So it's a true statement to say that's green or whatever shade it is. Because God maintains that color from week to week. God is behind it. And that makes it true. 3 plus 5 is 8. Why is that? Because God preserves the creation so that happens every single day. 3 plus 5 is 8. Because God is behind it. Unchanging truth. You are preserved the way you are. Though we all grow older and we're changing, yet we are the same person preserved from the time we're born until the time we die and go to heaven. Why? Because God is there sustaining you. You do not change into another person. You do not change into another creature. You are what you are because God preserves you in truth. All the events that a red car hits a white car and you have a crash is because God is behind that. He has determined that that will happen. And it happened. And it's true when you go to the witness and you say, the red car hit the white car. It's true because God is behind it. Determining all these things. That President Obama is president is true because God has determined it and preserves him there in that office. Truth is always tied to God. Whether it's directly in theology or even in our daily life, it's tied to God who is truth. In the covenant, you can see how tremendously important the truth is for maintaining our covenant relationship that God has with us And that we have with God. The covenant is founded on God Himself, of course. He's the very pattern of the covenant as He lives within Himself in blessed covenant fellowship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the pattern for our covenant relationship with Him. But think of how the whole of our covenant life with God depends on God telling the truth. All the promises that God made. When Adam and Eve fell into sin and they were ashamed and they thought the end had come, surely they would be destroyed. And God said, no, I will make you to be my friends because I will send the seed of the woman that will destroy the serpent. And by that, make you to be my friends. That's God's promise. God promised Noah, yes, I destroyed this world with a flood, but I will never do it again. I have a covenant with the whole creation. I will never again destroy the world with a flood. He came to Abraham and said, I establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. He promised Israel and Messiah that would 
reconcile them to Him somehow through the shedding of blood. And so they would take their lambs and they would take their bulls and their goats and offer them to the Lord depending on the promise of God that He would send the reality. They knew that lamb couldn't purchase them. That bull could not take away their sins. But they believed the promise of God that it would happen. He promises us righteousness. We are righteous in Jesus Christ. He promises. Christ has accomplished salvation. Eternal life awaits us. Jesus Christ is coming again. Let's just stop for a moment and consider what happens if God is not a God of truth. If even one of those promises is not true. It all falls apart. We have no relationship with Him. It's all a mirage. If God is not the God of truth, the whole covenant relationship, our trust in Him, our being able to speak with Him, our friendship with Him depends on God being a God of truth. And then I think of those who would say that when we baptize a child, every one of those child receives a promise from God. Promise of a covenant, redemption in Christ, forgiveness of sins, eternal life is given to every single child. A promise from God to every child. And I think, where's the covenant relationship? What happens when that child falls away? What happens to all the covenant promises of God if this one can fail? Or, of course, and their answer is, oh, but it depends on you. The promises of God, the truth of the promises of God depends on me Keeping a condition, that's contrary to all the promises that I just went through with you, starting from Adam and Eve, through Noah and Abraham and Israel and us. All those promises are absolutely true in Jesus Christ. And now all of a sudden, here we have a conditional promise. It can't go. It destroys the very foundation of the covenant. The promises of God never fail because God is truth. That's what makes lying so evil. Every kind of lie. It's a denial of God's truth. It's a denial of God Himself. The devil is behind all those lies. His name means slanderer. He's a liar. Jesus said He's a liar from the beginning and the father of the lie. He hates the truth because He hates God. He does everything in His power to twist, to pervert, to cover up the truth. He will do this directly as He did with Eve and say to Eve, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of all the trees of the garden. He's just hinting a little bit. And then when when Eve answered him, he said, directly contradicting God's word, you will not die. You will not die. God said you will die, you won't die. Directly contradicting the truth of God that they would. All through history has been twisting the truth. In the Old Testament, sending lying prophets among the Israelites. Today, sending false teachers who take this word of God and twist it and pervert it into the lie. This is Satan's major work. He's a deceiver. But in addition to that, 
The devil does everything he can to turn the truth on its head in every way, in every sphere of life. He wants to make the whole race of man to be a race of liars who will lie about anything and everything because anything true is in harmony with God's reality. Anything true is in harmony with God in some way, whether it's directly or indirectly. So he wants to make the whole race to be constantly lying. Lying about what time they got out of bed. Lying about what they did last week. Lying about what their plans are. Lying about everything. This is what he wants. The devil drives his spiritual children who are born liars. They're born that way. So are we. But he wants to make all men to be lying more and more. To deny that there is a God. Man didn't dare do that for a long time, but finally he got up the courage and said, we don't even need God. There is evolution. Now we can get rid of him totally. There is no God. There is none. Is there lie? They deny that God is in the creation controlling all things. They deny that there ever could be miracles. God is not the one that sends you health. God is not the one that sends you sickness. God has Nothing to say about what happens in this life. That's their lie. There is no God. They're very bold. The devil sets man up as a standard. What man feels. His opinions. His vote. Becomes truth. For today. That's now truth. Thus it changes from one generation to the next. Or one decade, or one year to the next. There are no absolutes. Even in the world's entertainments, they like illusions, movies, which are not at all really what they are, it's all a lie. The video games that can be so real, and which allow people to act out their own sinful desires, it's all a lie. Even that is part of their, their way of living. They like to live a lie. Have you ever heard anybody actually get angry at work because of something that happened on a television program and will get angry about someone? I, I shake my head and say, really, that's all an illusion. That's not even reality. But they live that way. Now he's drawing us all into our little pads and our little telephones and our and saying, this is reality. This is life. He wants that. To deny the reality of the glory of the creation and the glory of the Creator. To live a lie. All truth is twisted. It's all covered up. He's making way for the lie when the Antichrist can come and say, I am your Savior. You may call me Jesus. Because I'm Savior. That's the ultimate lie. Man coming into the temple of God and saying that he is God. All truth is important. Even the smallest part in our life because everything traces finally back to God himself. God is truth. God hates, therefore, all lying as indeed they are the proper works of the devil. He hates them. And He forbids it. And He forbids everything that's related to it. And that's why He comes to us and He says, you must resist this. You must resist all forms of deception. The Catechism breaks it down nicely for us into four areas where we are to be on our guard. We are to be on our guard and resist every deception. And the first involves bearing witness, that I bear false witness against no man. That's the first part of the command. Bearing false witness against no man starts in a court of law where you take an oath and you say, I promise to, to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. An oath. 
And then a man that, get, that goes into that witness chair and speaks the lie and says, this man did it or this man didn't and lies about it. He's bearing false witness against him. But that doesn't stop with a court of law. That goes into all of our life. Bearing false witness means simply saying something wrong about another person, saying this is what he did, whether it's under oath or not. Closely connected with that is falsifying every man's words. Falsifying any man's words. Falsifying his words means that you take them out of context and you make them to say something that they didn't say, something that was not intended to say, giving them a different meaning, taking them out of context, or even saying them with a different tone can give a totally different idea to what the man or woman intended it to mean, falsifying their words. God counts bearing false witness or falsifying words as lying. A second way that the commandment is broken is that we are not concerned about a man's name, that we are backbiters and slanderers, that I be no backbiter or slanderer. There's a difference between those two words. They're both evil. They're both forbidden. But backbiting means that you're telling an evil story about someone and it's true. It's a true story. But your motive, of course, is to tear him down and therefore it's the wrong thing for you to do. You're repeating an evil story hoping to tear him or her down. That's backbiting. Slander is telling an evil story that's in fact a lie. Or mostly a lie. That's slander. That's even punishable by law. The world recognizes the evil of that. But God puts them both in the same camp. We are not allowed to say when someone challenges us, when we're telling an evil story about someone, and someone says, what, are you really sure about that? Oh, it's true, it's true. It may be true, but it's still violating the ninth commandment. Because we are backbiting, speaking evil about someone in order to tear them down. This is one of the most grievous sins in the church of Jesus Christ. Backbiting. I tell you, I could weep from all the experiences of people in the church of Jesus Christ who have come to me and other office bearers and say, do you know what she said about me? Do you know what she's telling everyone about me? Do you know what he is saying about me? Tearing apart the church of Jesus Christ with words, just words, breaking this commandment. Proverbs 26 is pretty explicit, and it couldn't be put any better. Verse 22, the words of a talebearer are as wounds. Now a wound on my arm can be sewed up and it will heal. But these wounds go into the innermost parts of the belly. They go to the very core of my being. And they sit there as wounds until I die. The wounds, the words of a talebearer. It doesn't even say a slanderer, does it? It's just a talebearer. It just could be just a backbiter. They go into our souls and they cut wide open. Repeating stories just repeating stories in the church of Jesus Christ 
is the cause for 99% of things that do not get solved. Proverbs again. Verse 20. Verse 20. Where no wood air is, the fire goeth out. Everybody knows that. Children understand that. If you don't have any wood, the fire goes out. What's the point? Where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. Is there a, a fight going on between two people in the congregation? If everybody shuts their mouths about it and doesn't repeat things and they don't repeat things, it will die. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. And God's word is not merely don't speak the gossip, don't speak the slander, but God's word to us is do not listen to it. Do not give them an ear. Chase them away with an angry look. Concerning a man's name then, that we be no backbiter or slanderer, this is the second way. The third, that I do not judge nor join in condemning any man rashly or unheard. The catechism is so practical here. It knows our nature so very well. How easy is it when we hear an evil about someone to join in condemning him? Without even going to the person asking, is this true? I've heard this. Do you know what someone said to me? Just simply to conclude it must be right. What a horrible thing. Isn't it terrible? Within the church even, this sin is found. What a horrible way to act. We condemn them just like that. That's all you have to think about at a moment. If someone went to someone else in this congregation and said, do you know what so-and-so did or said? What would you want that person who's hearing that to say? Would you not want them to say, I don't believe that. That person wouldn't do that. And then come and talk to you about it? That's what you would do if, if someone came to, your, came, came to you and said, do you know what your wife did? You would say, I don't believe that. Some evil story about your wife or your children? You would say, I don't believe it. And then you would go find out, not because you uh, suspect, but because you have to settle this. That's the way we have to treat each other in the church of Jesus Christ, especially in the world too, but that when someone comes with an evil story, our conclusion is not, oh yeah, that figures. I saw that in that person. No, but our, our response is, I do not believe it. I don't believe it. And I don't want to hear any more about it. Don't line up your proof. I don't believe it. Then follow it up, if you think you need to. But don't believe the evil story. Don't join in rashly condemning them and immediately assuming that it's true and that they are guilty of the thing which has been told you. That's rashly, unheard condemnation of the neighbor. That's the third. And then the fourth, that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit as the proper works of the devil. And that next line is a fearful line, lest I would bring down upon me the heavy wrath of God. That I avoid all lies and deceit, all forms of the lie, white lies that we think will be good to help God somehow or help His people. Imagine that. We think we're going to help God or His people using a lie. Just a little bit of the twisting of the truth. All kinds of 
speech to people, flattery of others, that simply is not true. All deceit. We must view anything that is not true as the proper work of the devil because that's what it is. That's what it is. You will never do God's work using deception. The devil and his followers use lies incessantly. And you see why this is so evil, all this talk, not only because it destroys, but it destroys, that, that shows the motive behind it. It's hatred. It's hatred that lies behind it. Hatred of God. Romans 1 speaks of people that are full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters. And then the next word is haters of God. That ties it all together. They hate God. That's why they are deceitful, full of malignity, whisperers, backbiters. They hate God. And they hate the neighbor. Proverbs 26, verse 24. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit in him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. It's hatred. How can I damage that person? How can I tear that person down? How can I cut him off or her off? With the tongue. Not only hatred, but pride and ambition. It's stinking pride that responds to gossip about someone with the attitude, I would never do such a thing as that. None of my children would ever be guilty of such a thing. That's our attitude. Pride. We tear people down in order that we may get higher than them, we think. We can be even glad when an enemy falls. You know, even that's a sin. To be glad when your enemy falls is condemned by the Word of God. These sins rise out of our depraved nature and they have to be rooted out. God hates them. He hates them. They will assuredly be punished. Proverbs 26 again. Verse 26. Whoso hate, whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. That deceit ultimately will lead to a man's name being announced here that says this person is guilty of these sins. God in His judgment so hates sin that He will cause it to take over a man's life. And He walks in greater and greater sin. A believer obviously has to run to the cross daily for this sin. Forgiveness for these dreadful sins we must seek at the cross. We are all guilty. From the child who comes home to mom and dad with an evil story about a teacher, even if it's true, with an evil story about the teacher, trying to get the teacher in trouble, to a teenager who smears the reputation of a fellow student or of a teacher. The woman who sits, and we used to say on the telephone, but now it's Facebook and texting and all the other means of exploding the lies and the gossip. To the man who listens to an evil report. Anyone that rejoices at an evil report concerning his enemy. Anyone that brings a false report to a fellow, about a fellow member in the congregation. It's all lying. It's all a violation of the ninth commandment. God hates it. And our calling is to fall on our knees and beg for forgiveness. And we will find it. Because the one in whom there was no guile, no deceit, who spoke the truth at all times in his life, every time he opened up his mouth, he didn't have to say everything that was in his head, you don't have to either. But everything that he said was always truth. 
He could take our sins, our backbiting, our slander, our evil speaking, and pay for it on the cross. And He did. We go to the cross for forgiveness. We go to the cross for the grace that we need. To fight against the sin which is embedded in our nature. The grace to hate it. To bridle the tongue. That world of iniquity which is, says James, set on fire of hell. Speak the truth. Resist all evil. All deception. Because the tongue is such a beautiful thing if it is properly used in the sphere of the covenant. It is. God gave us a tongue. He has not given any other creature that He has made other than angels, any earthly creature, the ability to communicate as we can, to express our thoughts, to make judgments, to... Have conversations. This is only something that belongs to man. And so he calls us to speak the truth. You have a tongue that I've given you. Love the truth. Have it fill your heart so that you cannot wait to speak of the truth. The truth, first of all, about God. That we can get together on a Sunday night and not gossip about other people, but talk about God Talk about His great works. Talk about what He's done for us and the things that He has promised us. That's why we have tongues. To talk about the truth of God. To confess that truth before the church. To confess that truth before each other and before the world as well. He's given us a tongue that we may defend the good character of our nature. Not let someone else run him down there and stand mute, but that we may open our mouths and say, that's not true. That can't be true. I won't believe that. And defend the good character of the neighbor whenever we hear evil. To promote, says the catechism, to promote the honor and good character of the neighbor as we would have them do to us. We use our mouth to do the same. But obviously the greatest joy and the most important function that the tongue has in the covenant is fellowship. That's what the covenant is. It's fellowship. Fellowship with God. Being able to use our tongues to pour out our hearts before God. To express to Him our secret thoughts. To express to Him the the desires that we have. To be able to show Him how thankful we are and how much we love Him. The tongue is able to do that. To be able to praise Him with our writing. To be able to praise Him with our speech and our songs. To sing the praises of our God. No other creature in this world has that ability to do that. The birds sing, but they cannot communicate the same ideas. The meaningful praise that we can concerning our God. Covenant fellowship. God speaking to us so that we can understand His speech. And we speaking to God. That's the heart of the covenant God has established with us. Fellowship. And then believers with each other. That's part of the covenant too. God did not give us tongues so that we may be busy backbiting and slandering and lying about each other. We have to remember that. Children, God did not give you that tongue so that you could ridicule your fellow student in the class, in the, in the playground. That's not why you have a tongue. God did not give you tongue, teenagers, so that you could complain and speak rebellious words against your parents or your teachers. God did not give you tongues, husbands and wives, so that you could snap at each other and criticize each other and argue your case against each other. That's not why we have tongues. He did not give us tongues as fellow members so that we could tear each other down. We have tongues for fellowship. For the beauty 
of being able to talk to each other and commune with each other and have a true friendship with each other. To teach, to comfort, to rejoice together. That's why we have the gift of speech. What a a beautiful gift. What a powerful gift God has given us. Because the tongue is so powerful, you see, it has a tremendous power for evil. But look at what it's supposed to be, a beautiful power for good. That when you go to heaven, you'll be able to talk with an innumerable number of saints, company a company of saints, and be able to talk to each other about what great things God has done for you. And how you'll be able to talk with God Himself. Again, I say that's the essence of life with God. Listen to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. Isaiah 65, verse 24, talking about our life in heaven. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. There's fellowship with God there, enjoying life with Him. May God grant that that powerful instrument of our tongues is used not in deception, not in tearing down, but for the glory of His name, for covenant fellowship in our homes, in our schools, and in the church. Amen. Let us pray. God of truth, we pray before Thee, recognizing our sinfulness, but thanking Thee for the gift, not only of the tongue, but of Thy grace. Sanctify us by Thy truth, because that we indeed praise Thee and enjoy fellowship with Thee and each other through this marvelous gift. For the glory of thy name now and forever. Amen.